Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Organic Prototyping with the Subdivision Tool. My name is Ellie Ramsey, and I'm the Senior Marketing Coordinator for Vectorworks Architect. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest presenter, Jacob Dale from Tangibly. Jacob is a creative director, founder, and BIM expert at Tangibly, which he established in 2015 to help creative studios, both large and small, maximize their use of Vectorworks design software to create better performance and profit. Tangibly offers Vectorworks training micro workshops, learning retreats, and consulting services to help design firms. He also has more than 16 years of experience designing and managing projects in architecture, construction, real estate development, and entertainment design using Vectorworks and other leading design softwares. Today's webinar will take you from the creation of an organic shape using the subdivision tool through preparing a basic file for physical prototyping. A few housekeeping things before we begin. This webinar is accredited for one AIALU, so if you're watching live, you will receive your credits and certificate of completion following the webinar. If you're watching the recording, there will be a link for the test available so that you can receive credit for watching. And with that, I think that's all I have, Jacob, so I'm turning the mic over to you. Thank you, Emily. I am excited to have everybody on this webinar today. We actually have a really good turnout. I the reason why I'm excited is the subdivision tool has been a great addition to Vectorworks as of the 2016 version, and I've been tinkering with this quite a bit over the last year. In fact, we presented on this at the uh, Vectorworks Design Summit in Chicago just recently, and I've also been doing live demos of this at the AIA convention and also the Architectural Record Innovation Conference recently. love this tool because it is really changing the way that we can design in the computer and, and we'll get to see a lot of examples of that. Um, the, the ability to just organically shape and mold an object in the digital environment is really something unprecedented. So um, we have uh, a lot in store for you, so please stay tuned. So like Emily said, this is um, available for AIA credits. So if you're looking for learning credits, there will be um, a brief quiz that follows up with this, as Emily mentioned, so that you can get those credits. And here is the requisite legal information for that. Um, today in our talk, our learning objectives are to create an organic shape using the subdivision tool. We're also going to investigate the effects and uses of all the submodes and controls of this tool. We will distinguish between the types of objects that can be modeled, and we're also going to know how to generate them from a subdivide object. And we're going to prepare a basic file for physical prototyping, which is actually pretty straightforward out of Vectorworks. Now, the organic prototyping with the subdivision tool, um, subdivision is a a method of representing a smooth service with a linear polygonal mesh. So that's a very descriptive or a very technical way of describing that the computer will average the, the curves of the, the mesh that you've designed. And the way that the interface is set up in Vectorworks, you can really model things with your OpenGL rendering setting and everything just appears smooth as it is, but you can also take a peek at that polygonal mesh as well by changing your view settings to wireframe or using the x-ray mode tool and looking into the wireframe. Now you may recognize this particular icon here. Well this is an image of the teapot and historically the teapot is iconic because it was the first 3D object that was modeled in the computer. This is actually the result of a dissertation by Edwin Catmull. Edwin Catmull is actually now current president of Pixar Animation Studios. But the challenge back in the 1970s and previous to that was to render smooth objects in the computer with a compressed processing ability. And um, Ed Catmull was one of the first to actually discover a way to do that. And he also discovered that simultaneously as Jim Clark as you'll see there in history. But it is also the reason why you see now the icon of the teapot and a lot of modeling and rendering programs and uh, Vectorworks included. So what we see today in a lot of animation is really, especially coming from Pixar, is based in the sub D base code. So the, the open sub D library is applied to a lot of 3D modeling software today. One of those in particular is Vectorworks. Vectorworks released 
the ability to use sub D modeling in um, 2016. And so we've been having a lot of fun discovering where that goes. And there are even more updates to come in 2017 as uh, they continue to improve their software. You may recognize uh, these particular characters here. The first animated feature that Pixar released in 1996 was actually Toy Story, but there was a short film just prior to Toy Story called Jerry's Game in which it depicts uh, an older gentleman playing a chess game, and it was uh, the absolute first project that Open Subdiv Library was applied to computer animation. So the tools of our evolution. They really do shape our world. We are only as good as the tools that we have access to. And historically, at one point, we were sheltered only by nature around us, caves that we found, caves that we carved, any shelter that we could build. And we used, at a very simple time, even just depicting images to communicate with each other. Well, obviously, we have evolved through the centuries through the evolution of our tool. Today, the pinnacle of our building technology is symbolized by, we, by what you see there on the right-hand side. Okay, well, this particular technology has been around for more than 50 years now. Seagram Building, an iconic building there in New York. That is the contemporary modernism that you see in most cities today. Uh, large rectangles, they're, they're beautiful, they're efficient, they're affordable, and they're abundant. But everything does not necessarily fit into a box. We live in a natural world that's shaped by gravity and shaped by the organic forms all around us. And if we are to be inspired by those natural forms as we influence the designed world around us, we might need access to a design tool that is or organic in nature as well, gives us the ability to produce organically shaped objects directly from that model. So what I'd like to discuss today is the primitive and the cage. These are the foundation of Open Sub D library, also known as the subdivision tool in Vectorworks. What you see here is a cage of points connected by lines. So that is the cage. And the primitive is the donut shape that you see contained within that cage. As you are manipulating the points on that cage or the lines or the faces of that cage, the primitive on the inside of it is also manipulated. So as you stretch it, as you pull it, as you scale it, that cage or that primitive will also change. So what we're seeing here is a wireframe, but when you are to render this object in OpenGL, you will also see surfaces applied to that wireframe. And so we're going to see some examples of that. When you want to create a primitive within Vectorworks, you would need to go to the 3D modeling tool set, oftentimes parked on the lower left-hand corner of your interface. And we'll open up Vectorworks in a little while, but I just want to go over some of the, the basic functions of the tool, where you can find it, and how to activate it. So when I initially opened up Vectorworks 2016 to uh, really dig into this subdivision tool, I clicked once on the edit subdivision tool in the uh, tool set, and nothing happened. And so I was curious as to you know, what was going on. I clicked on it again. Nothing happened. Well, it took me about a day to kind of figure out that I must double click there. So um, I'm a creature of habit. I only click on my tools once. But in this particular scenario here, on your tool sets, double click on the edit subdivision tool, and that will activate the screen you see there on the right hand side. We see create subdivision primitive as the title of that screen. And what we'll recognize is if we click on the top drop down menu, we get a variety of primitive shapes that we can start with everything from a sphere down to a circle. So 
the group of objects that you see there at the top, the top four, the sphere, the cylinder, the cube, and the torus, are all three-dimensional shapes. They're closed shapes, which means they have a surface on all sides. And as you stretch, as you pull them, as you pinch them and scale them, it's going to have a surface on all sides regardless. Now, the four shapes that you see toward the bottom, the square, the triangle, circle, and ring, those are similar shapes to the ones above, but they're flat. They have no volume. They're simply a surface. Yes, you can manipulate them in all the same manner as all the other shapes, but what you're not going to have is an enclosed volume with these. You simply have a shell, and we'll learn a little bit more about that. So when you open the Sub-D tool at the menu bar at the top, you're going to see the sub-menu of different options within the subdivision tool. And we see that at the top of this screen. And let's talk about some of the basic functions of that tool and how it operates. So what we're seeing there in the image is the 3D dragger. And that is symbolized by the three axes of X, Y, and Z. And what this is, is effectively a tangible way to manipulate an object with your X, Y, and Z coordinates. So if you grab on a handle and pull in one direction, it's going to go in that direction of the coordinate. We'll see here that using the 3D dragger, if you click on the face of the cage, and then use the, the angle connecting the two coordinates on the 3D dragger, you can actually activate a rotate face function, allowing you to manipulate the cage and the primitive itself. Translate face is when you click on the small blue dot that connects your three axes, as you see there in the moving image. If you click on that dot, well, let me correct myself. Actually, if you were to click on the axis that is parallel to the face that you are selecting, then that allows that face of the cage to be manipulated on that one particular axis. If you click on the small dot that connects all three of your axes, then you have the ability to shape your object in free form. So you can essentially push, pull, uh, move within uh, a plane or within all of 3D space inside your modeling space without hesitation. One thing to note right now is when I created these demo files, I turned off all of my snaps. Because in Vectorworks, we use snaps a lot to inform how objects go together, how they are, how they snap to each other, essentially. But when you are using a freeform modeling tool like this, you don't necessarily want this object to snap to other points within your model. So you can temporarily disable that using the tilde key that's just on the upper left-hand corner of your keyboard, just below the escape key, or you can just unclick all of your snaps, which allows you to very organically move most of these points within the subdivision tool. Aside from moving in the X, Y, and Z, you also have the ability, using the 3D dragger, to grab on the arcs that match between the axes and a twist in either direction that you desire. And you can even go more than 360 degrees if you want to tie your object into a knot. Very popular in 3D modeling today is a push-pull feature. So you see that in a lot of other 3D modeling products. Essentially a very basic way to enlarge or squash your object, object. And in this circumstance, all you would simply do is select the face of the cage that contains the primitive and pull in a perpendicular direction of that face or push in a perpendicular direction to reshape your object. 
Another really neat feature that is built into the subdivision tool is the second mode of the tool, and that's the crease mode. And what we see right now is creasing on points of the cage. So you'll notice that the edge of the cage and the face of the cage do not attach to the primitive. The primitive actually just attaches to the points which we click on, otherwise known as a point crease. So there are several different modes of the crease, and the next one would be the edge. So that is symbolized in the icon of this mode of the tool. And as we click on the edges, we see that that primitive reaches out to the edges of the cage. Now it's not connecting, <coughs> pardon me, to those points, but it is reaching out toward the edges. If you do want the face of your object to reach all the way out to the cage, then you would use the face crease mode, which effectively just activate the crease mode of the tool and click on a face of your cage to attach the primitive. Now if you wanted to turn a sphere into a cube, then you would essentially rotate this object within the modeling environment and click on all of the faces of the cage and you would effectively have a cube made from a sphere. The third mode within subdivision is the face extrude mode. Now this is different from the transform mode that we looked at originally in that it adds more cage geometry to your modeling environment. Effectively what you see here in this image is that when you click on the face and drag either inward or outward of the object, it adds a whole new cage and therefore more control of your particular object but also extends that primitive outward or inward to further articulate what you may be trying to achieve. What is more, there's actually an ability to split the faces of the cage, again, allowing you even more control of that primitive object. And that face can be set at a certain percentage so as you see there, the, the data bar is showing a split percentage. You can actually use the tab key into that data bar and enter an exact percentage of that face that you want the new split face to take. The fifth mode of the subdivision tool actually allows us to see through the primitive itself. And it's, it's called the face hole, but I say see through because you're technically not removing that face from the primitive. You're essentially just turning it off in this mode so you can see the internal geometry of the primitive that you've created. If you click on one of the faces that you've created a hole in with the face hole tool, that will turn the hole back on. This is not deleting that face of the primitive in particular. If you were wanting to delete that face and make this solid object a shell object, then you would use the initial transform tool and select a face and actually hit the delete key to remove that face. But a word of caution, if you do delete a face, there is no way in subdivision in this current version to actually replace a face that you've already deleted. So you've permanently shifted a, a solid object to one of more of a 2D object like the circle, the square, the triangle like we discussed previously. The sixth mode of the subdivision tool is the edge extend mode. In this particular mode, you would need to delete one of the faces like I just discussed. So we see there in the image that I selected the top face of the sphere and actually hit delete. And what that does is give me an open edge of the primitive that can associate with the cage. And when I select the edge extend 
mode of the subdivision tool and click on a particular edge, it makes the primitive attached to that edge, but then you can also drag that edge as far as you'd like. Again, you can use the data display bar there and hit tab and enter the exact distance that you would like to extrude that particular face. You may also notice that these two faces are not snapping to each other, and that is because I disabled snapping altogether. Another reason why you might actually want to leave your snaps on and use the tilde key to temporarily disable snaps, because in this situation, you might actually want those two edges to snap together and remain collinear. And finally, in the subdivision tool, we have the edge split mode. This is truly the foundation of subdivision. As you'll see there in the image, we are effectively subdividing the primitive by subdividing the cage. So when we cl click on an edge, we see that that split goes all the way around the object. And again, we can place that percentage at a particular point on that cage if we like. The more splits in the cage, the more refined our primitive becomes. Therefore, we have even more control of that primitive shape as we continue to model. So beyond the basic functions of the tool, we have, we're going to return to this 3D dragger tool. Now, we had seen the 3D dragger tool previously with an arc that connects the axes in that if we moved that arc, we could actually change the angle of the face. Well, we see here in this particular function of the 3D dragger, we're actually scaling on one axis of that particular object. And you'll see that the 3D dragger no longer has those arcs connecting each axis. So the difference here is what you'll see just to the right of the pipe on the menu bar up top is that there are actually two different 3D dragger settings that we can choose from. And this one in particular allows us to scale an object. Well, more than just scaling one particular face of the cage, we can select multiple faces, as I've done in this image. So I've selected these two faces and then used the scale 3D dragger mode to actually scale those faces and manipulate the primitive within the cage. you have the ability to scale in two different axes at the same time. And the way that you do that is using the scale 3D dragger. You select one face on the object. This doesn't work on two faces at once. So you select one face of the cage and the, the quarter circle that's connecting those two axes on the dragger is where you want to click. So in this particular instance, I'm clicking on that yellow tab there and pulling outward and pushing inward, and that effectively scales the cage and therefore scales our primitive within the cage. So this third mode of the 3D dragger will not manipulate your cage or your primitive in any respect. What it is, is it the ability to move the dragger to another position that may be more accessible, more visible, especially when you have a more articulated 3D model. Uh, maybe we've added a lot more cage geometry to this object and the 3D dragger is hidden behind the, uh, behind the primitive in some way, so this makes it more visible. It also allows you to realign the actual angle of the 3D dragger in respect to your cage. So there are two sub-modes to this 3D dragger tool, and one of those is aligned to cage, and the other is aligned to working plane. And we'll see that all the way to the right-hand side of the tool. And aligned to cage effectively will align the 3D dragger 
parallel to the axes of the cage itself. And the second mode, Align to Working Plane, actually requires a, another surface in your modeling environment that is not a subdivision surface to establish a working plane that you may want to manipulate your subdivision cage with through the 3D dragger. So you'll see here that I've established a conical surface and then use the set working plane tool and set the working plane at an angle. And when I click on the face of the, the cage of this subdivision object, you'll notice that the 3D dragger is actually in line with the colored axes that we see there on the working plane. So the green arrow is in line with the green line on the working plane. So you may want to use this particular tool when you have a lot of objects already in your environment and perhaps you're looking to match one of the faces of the cage to existing geometry. Remember that you can set your working plane and then also set your 3D dragger by your working plane. So what options do we have after we've created a primitive? Well, the subdivision tool is a self-contained modeling process built within Vectorworks. So we create these objects, but then how do we apply them to our modeling environment and do things like create structure from them, create surfaces from them, apply textures to them, basically relate them to the rest of our modeling environment. Well, we have these conversion options. If we go to Modify Convert from the menu of Vectorworks, and we have four different options to convert them to. Uh, mesh, 3D Poly, NURBS, and Generic Solids. Uh, you may recognize using NURBS quite a bit for any lofted surfaces. Um, typically in 3D modeling, if you're looking for a very organic shape, before subdivision modeling was available, folks would use NURBS to create flowing surfaces and then take those surfaces and reduce them to structure or lines in some way to better inform their documents. Another commonly used tool in Vectorworks is generic solids. If you were to, connect, if you were to convert your subdivision object into a generic solid, that then gives you the ability to add and subtract solids and apply surfaces, uh, textures to those objects and tie them into the rest of your model. So once we've created these 3D objects, we might actually want to bring them into the real world in a tangible form. And how might we do that directly from Vectorworks? We, we don't even necessarily have to convert our subdivision object into uh, a generic solid or a NURB surface or anything like that. We could effectively take that subdivision object and export directly for printing. And I'm talking about printing in a physical form. Some of the most common formats for printing in additive or subtractive, otherwise known as 3D printers or um, CNC routers, those file formats are STL and uh, STEP files. Um, STL is actually very common. And the great thing about an STL file format is that a lot of 3D printers will recognize the overall volume of your shape, and then they have built-in software that will reduce that shape to a shelled surface so that your, your object is not uh, completely composed of the same material. It essentially will create a honeycomb structure or something similar within so that you have a somewhat hollow object, but it has a solid surface as you have modeled it. So what we're seeing is that our tools of design are evolving. This is a very exciting tool that 
has just now been available to us for the past year in Vectorworks. And like I mentioned, there are a large group of updates to this tool coming in 2017, so we look forward to updating you on those features, very exciting features that we feel that are, are really going to revolutionize the way that we create objects within the 3D space on a computer. So what you see here in this image is an object that I created in Vectorworks from a sphere and stretched it out and the concept was a potential apartment block and an urban core and placing light wells within that object and the way that I achieved this particular object was stretching that sphere in different directions with the, the transform mode on the cage pulling on points effectively coming out to something relatively rectilinear but there's actually no flat surface or parallel edge on this particular object. Well, after it was modeled inside Vectorworks, I took the subdivision object and exported it as an STL format. And you'll see in that object there on the lower left, that honeycomb structure that I was just referring to, filling in the, the space within that object. So it's not a, a solid core object. The reason why you do that is first for lightness and structure, but also to reduce the volume of material that's being used. Now, how long did it take to create this object? Well, obviously it's a very conceptual shape, and there wasn't necessarily a, a very regimented intention or constraint involved with this project. But just to get a conceptual idea out to model this and also to print it in 3D, we're talking about less than a couple hours, and that includes printing time. Now, these three objects you see in the image are essentially about three inches wide and an inch and a half deep, and the three objects all together cost an average of about $20 to have printed. And the great thing about it is you can print it in almost any material imaginable at whatever scale you desire. So we've gone from a very quick conceptual idea in a 3D modeling environment to something that's printed and tangible that we can hold in our hand not only the same day but quite potentially within a couple of hours. So if you have a design concept meeting with your team, with a client, with a contractor, if you need to create an iteration of that to pass around the table, it may be discussed over lunch. These things are becoming more and more possible, and the resource for these particular objects is definitely from an organic modeling environment like the one you will find in Vectorworks with the subdivision tool. So what I can do now is switch over to the Vectorworks interface and we can look at where those tools are located in relationship to each other and more of a real-time manipulation of this particular object. And while I'm doing that, I'd love to um, reflect on any of the um, questions that we might have come up uh, while I was discussing this. And if you have not yet had a chance to voice a question or or an interest in particular, please do so now so that we can address those. So what we see here is a primitive of that sphere that I was discussing in the slideshow. And that was created directly from clicking on the edit subdivision tool that we find in our 3D modeling tool set. Now if I click on this sphere, I'm going to just go ahead and delete it right now so that you can see the process of creating that subdivision. And if we see the Create Subdivision Primitive menu that pops up there, we have the ability to select between all of the shapes that we discussed previously. Well, in this circumstance, I'm going to select the sphere, and we have the ability to establish the size of that particular object we might want to use. 
and down here at the bottom at center location, we can choose to center at the next click or just allow that object to be placed at the zero. So I'm going to allow that to be placed at the zero origin. And when we click into our space, we see that primitive and the cage. Well, right now we're seeing it in a right isometric view, and therefore it's rendered in OpenGL. But if I were to look at it in top plan, we're going to see this object in wireframe. So we see truly the mesh that represents the primitive within the cage. Well, these particular objects are likely a lot uh, more straightforward to edit from an isometric view. If you have a middle mouse button on your mouse or a, a scroll wheel, if you press down on the scroll wheel on most interfaces, you would be able to orbit around your object in real time without deactivating the subdivision tool. So that's a really nice way to manipulate or move around your 3D environment. Um, there are also other peripheral devices that can be acquired that work with the 3D modeling environment that allow you to orbit on the fly as well. So if you're going to be doing a lot of 3D modeling, especially with the subdivision tool, I would encourage you to explore those couple of options. Another thing for those of you using an extended keyboard, if you use the number pad, you can actually navigate between your different views, whether they be top plan or isometric views, with the number pad on your keyboard. So what we're going to do now is just double click into this object and that activates the cage around it. Well, let's um, start to manipulate this object given the, the, the tool modes that we see there in the upper left hand corner. And the first one we start with is the transform mode and I have my 3D dragger translate and rotate mode selected. And if I select a face on that object, then I'm allowed to push or pull and essentially squash this object down into what looks kind of like a pancake shape. Now, just theoretically or conceptually, I'm thinking of a canopy or a um, some type of structure that would go over a transportation center, maybe a large convention or um, a entertainment venue of some sort. And so uh, a low sweeping rounded shape, no rectilinear form, you may have seen this at your local sports venue, but how do we get started with something so organic? We could mold it out of clay if we want to, but that's a bit messy. We could do it here on our computer if we have the right software. So what I've done is squash this sphere down to what looks like more like a pancake shape. And then I want to extend this, the cage, out so that we can begin, begin to manipulate our primitive even more away from just this very basic um, rectilinear cage. So rather than transform and pull the cage away and elongate this object, I actually want to add some more cage geometry to that. And so what I'm going to do is go to the third mode of the subdivision tool, and that's the face extrude mode. And I'm going to select that and then select the face of that cage. And we'll see now that we get an additional amount of geometry that we can manipulate. So let's create an L-shaped structure here or surface of some sort. And we do that essentially by just using that third mode, the face extrude mode, to add cage geometry to this object. Now, as I rotate around that in particular, I can go to my flyover tool. We'll notice that if I click on my flyover tool here in the tool sets, it deactivates the edit function of our subdivision tool. But we see there that we have a nice flowing shape that is a bit of an L shape looks a little bit more like a boomerang, but no sharp edges anywhere on that particular surface. Well, perhaps we want a flat surface on the bottom of it so we can actually attach it to structure, um, attach it to a foundation, whatever it be. We can essentially just rotate to the bottom edge of that object, and then I go to my selection tool by hitting the X on my keyboard. Now that I have my selection tool, I can double click again 
on that subdivision object so that I can create my flat surfaces on those faces. Again, just to repeat from earlier, how would we do those? Uh, how would we achieve a flat surface on the bottom face? We would select the second mode of the subdivision tool, the crease mode, but rather than crease edges, we can select the whole face, and that allows us to create a flat surface on the bottom side of our primitive. So what we have now is switch into my flyover mode and we can rotate around. We'll notice that we have a flat surface that could meet our site in particular and we have a rounded shape above that might allow for rain to run off, snow, whatever it be, or just for aesthetic purposes in general. So let's say that our situation actually requires a little bit more incline. Let's say that the, the site actually has some slope to it and we want to bend this particular object. Well, again, we can activate that cage geometry. And one thing that I didn't demonstrate earlier that I could do now is that you can select points and edges simultaneously, but also by using a selecting window and dragging from the upper left to lower right while holding down the mouse button, I've selected some points on that object. Now we see our 3D dragger tool appear, and I want to use the arcs connecting two of the axes there on the 3D dragger to bend our object, and we'll see now that we're bending that object. Well, this may not be the point at which I want to bend it, so I'm going to back up there so I can just hit escape. If I haven't hit enter yet, then I can hit escape on those particular functions and that resets to my previous point. Well, what I want to do is move that 3D dragger using the 3D dragger uh, reposition mode so that the bend point of this object is more centered on that object in particular. Another thing that I want to do is actually change the angle of the bend so I can rotate that 3D dragger with one of the arcs there. And when I feel content that that's more or less in line with the, the bend that I want, then I go back to my translate and rotate mode. It leaves the 3D dragger in place. And then now I can grab one of those arcs and actually bend that object in the direction that I desire. So as I rotate around this object, we see that very quickly we have created something that would take you a lot of time to create with most of the contemporary modeling tools that are out there even today. And up until 2016, this may have taken you quite a bit of time to model, uh, but now with subdivision modeling, we've truly bent space and time and allowed a lot more function to your modeling environment your design concepts, and where you take this from here is really up to you. It's like having a lump of clay and um, exploring what could be in the world. What organic shape do you imagine? And as we see there, we can really continue to manipulate this quite a bit if we want to, but we only have about approximately 10 minutes left in this webinar, so what I'd like to do is just open it up to any questions um, in particular. Emily, do you have any questions that, um, that are rising to the top there? We do. We actually have a lot of good questions. Um, so thank you to everyone who's submitted them so far. Um, the first one, uh, I think this is from a bit back, but maybe you can touch on it again. How do you remove yeah. a split made from the edge split tool, and is there a way to join adjacent shapes that have been already been split? Um, so how do you move or how do you remove the split from an already split object? Mm -hmm. With the edge split. So if we double if we double click into that object and let's say that we wanted to split one of these edges, then we can split there. But that particular um, split is is splitting all the way through the object. So um, I actually haven't, to be honest, I haven't tried to remove a split in the past. So um, we might have to follow up with some notes on that. I, I don't believe that it's possible once you've split it. It's, um, it's kind of a, a one-directional scenario. Um, that's, that's my understanding 
of the of the of this particular tool. Um, okay, well, I'm, we can always follow yeah. up with some other stuff um, afterwards. We actually have a couple, so I'm going to throw these at you real quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, Let's see what we can. Have. What is the best way to annotate these objects with dimensions? Okay, so the great thing about these particular objects is um, they can be snapped to just like any other object in, in Vectorworks. So if you were looking to annotate this, um, the contemporary workflow in the Vectorworks environment might say that you create your objects in the design layer, but then you represent them through a viewport um, on a sheet layer. And then your annotations can actually be, um, your dimensions can be represented through that viewport. Um, so what I can do is I have this one particular object here, and we'll just, uh, for sake of live demos, we'll, we'll take a look at um, a function that I really enjoy a lot, especially when I'm conceptualizing objects in Vectorworks, and that is create multiple viewports. If you have an object here and you go to um, view, create multiple viewports, this is going to create a, a whole group of viewports of all of the objects within your design environment. So usually more appropriate for a more limited circumstance where you just have maybe a conceptual object like this. And so what I'm going to do is create um, a variety of multiple viewports here. And that viewport scale, I'm going to reduce that down a little bit to um, we'll see what this comes out to be. Um, it creates a new sheet, and it gives us four viewports of that object immediately. So, really beautiful thing about this is it's a very fast way to produce, um, to scale drawings of your concept. Now, this particular concept is in a, um, a measurement of inches in particular, so this, these are going to be relatively small objects. Uh, we'll see that these viewports need to be updated. I'm going to switch to a, a white background instead of a black background so we have a little bit more understanding of our viewports here. And I'm going to update, um, and we'll see that these um, objects are now manipulatable in, inside the, the viewport. So we can go to the annotations level, and if I select my dimension string, I can select one point here. It looks like it's not, oh, okay, of course. I don't have my snaps on, so I'll select a few snaps here. And as you'll see there, um, we are able to snap to any point within that mesh geometry that we desire. Well, we can also change the, well, let me just go ahead and prove that. So if we're looking for um, the outside edge of this object, we're snapping to that point, and maybe the outside edge of that object, and of course, our dimension scale would need to be edited a little bit, but there we go. That's a six and a half inch um, object that we see. And we did all that through the annotation level of a viewport. So I hope that accurately answers that question. Awesome. Um, okay, next one. How about working within specific scales? Meaning, if I need to know that, or, I'm sorry, if I know that I need to create an object that is confined by a specific size, how can you see that? Okay. Um, that's a great question, and um, I, when I first opened this tool, I didn't concern myself too much with um, constraints, but the reality is if we're designing for the real world, we have to work with constraints, right? So um, what I'm going to do is look in top plan here, and we see our wireframe of our object. Well, let's say that you have a, a site, for example, and this is going to be way out of scale in compar to, comparison to this four-inch object that we've created. Well, let's just say you have a 10-foot by a 20-foot um, booth at a show. And I have to, I could change the, um, the default fill of that object in particular. But let's say that this is the booth space that we have to design for. Um, you already know that that is 10 foot wide and 20 foot long. And if you were to create a primitive object, so we go back to the 3D modeling tools and double click on edit subdivision. And let's say that we want to create a, um, a torus that fits within that space. Well, we'll notice here on the torus that we have the ability to assign a major and a minor radius. And that, that um, major radius would effectively be, we'd need to be less than half of what the width of our space is. So if we were to say that that is um, four foot, for example, that's already set to feet then that was convenient for me, wasn't it? So 
we select that, and where did it park it? It actually, okay, so I misunderstood the, the measurement of the tool itself, and the radius is not to scale here. So we could back up, and let me try that one more time. So this object that I've created, so some things that kind of get me when I'm in a hurry in Vectorworks has gotten me here, and you'll notice that I didn't put my feet and inches in the right place. So the site that we have is not in proportion to the object that I just created. So like I said, we want a uh, booth space of 10 feet, so 10 and a foot marker, and then 20 foot and a foot marker, and hit enter, and this particular object is not cooperating. Okay, there we are. So that one is more to size. And again, uh, sorry for the bold colors there, but we'll size that appropriately. Now we have an accurately sized site. And again, if I repeat the method of creating a subdivision, like this one in particular, the torus with the four foot radius, if I say okay, then we'll see if perhaps we are looking to create a, um, let's say an inflatable swimming pool at this very exciting convention that we're about to attend, um, we would have a swimming pool that would be scaled appropriately to that. But you might be saying, well, what if we need to scale this or manipulate it so that it actually takes the shape of this space that we're working within? Well, we could select some of these points in particular and, again, use the 3D dragger to shape and perhaps uh, snap to the edges of that, uh, that space that we have to work with. So I hope that better illustrates um, the ability to model within scale in this environment with a very organic shape. Awesome. I know we're I know we're right on our three o'clock, um, but I'm going to give you a couple more. And if you guys want to hear the answers to some more questions, please feel free to stick around for those. Um, <laughs> you like this, Jacob? Comment from Phil. Uh, you could model the Chicago Blob with this. <laughs> <laughs> we were actually just there in April. Um, for our design summit, I don't know if you did model the uh, the bean at all, but it would. Um, no, actually, our, our friend Jonathan Pickup did model the bean, uh, and I think he he demonstrated that um, recently. So, if you are looking for the bean modeled in sub D, reach out to our friend Jonathan Pickup. So, uh, mm -hmm. but it's been a lot of fun modeling just really wild objects in the world and and coming up with new concepts for sure. Uh, Good one, Phil. I like that. <laughs> this sort of touches on that as well. Uh, have you done any mold making with this tool, and is there a good way to extract data points for machining? Um, the mold making, I think, would be um, something outside of Vectorworks, but um, how I, uh, at least physically, that is, um, to, to specify, if you are going to make a mold, I would consider um, taking a subdivision object um, so let's just walk through that real quick. I love doing these things on the fly. Um, I was doing this a lot at the AIA convention, and we came up with some just really fun stuff. Um, let's see here. Um, this this is my video game essentially. I, I I don't I don't play video games on the weekend. I play Vectorworks on the weekend. So let's just say that um, we want to create um, an odd shape uh, like the one I just created actually relatively quickly, and I'm just gonna manipulate this a little bit more um, so we have this particular shape that we might use and we want to create a mold of that object so what does that object look like in 3D I can rotate around that it has a little bit of an indentation there uh, maybe it's a coffee bean of some sort or a gumdrop that we're going to create um, at scale and we need to pour something into a mold right well what I would do is I would take this object and then I would use our ability to convert this object to a generic solid. Now, just keep in mind that when you convert, a, you can't go backwards, right? Once you've already created your uh, subdivision object and you've converted it into a generic solid, that's a one-way street. So you might consider duplicating your design layer to preserve that initial uh, design concept. But I'm going to go ahead and move forward here because I'm not really married to this concept here. And let's say you want me to convert to generic solid. And it says, do you want to continue? It's, uh, it's a one-way street. Okay, no problem. So we'll click on it now and confirm it's a generic solid. And I want to look at it in top plan. 
Now what, it, what I need to do is encase that object to create my mold. So let's just say we have a rectilinear mold. And how might we get that? Well, in this circumstance, we have a, I just start with a rectangle. And I might actually want to make that a different color. So we'll say our mold is blue. And go to my flyover. And we'll see that when you do create um, a subdivision object, your zero is along the middle plane of that object. So if we wanted to encase this object within another uh, solid object, for example, we might actually want to push pull or use the command D to extrude this shape above and below this primitive. So I'm going to fly underneath this and then again use the push pull to subtract there. And so the reason why, I'm sorry, to extend below, the reason why I say subtract is because what we have now is an extrude that we can convert into a generic solid. And that's a one-way street. But if we take the two and we subtract solids, and it and we say okay there, it's going to. Um, sorry, we tried to create an empty solid object, but let me back up there. Try it one more time. Let me make sure I'm subtracting the other solid. So when you subtract solids, oh sorry, right click. When you subtract solids, just make sure you're selecting the right object to retain. And what we have here now, I will use actually another one of my favorite tools in Vectorworks is the um, Clip Cube. You can activate the Clip Cube. I have the shortcut up there, Show Clip Cube. And when I activate that Clip Cube, I'm going to click on that surface of the Clip Cube, and we will extend inward. And what we see is the void of that sub D object. The sub D object has gone away. It's history, unless I've saved it on a design layer. And what we have now is a void. You can take this generic solid, output it as an STL file or any other 3D object, have it 3D printed, cut it in half, there's your mold. Very cool. All right, so let's do let's do one more. Um, this is a good one. Okay. Is there an easy way to generate serial planes from the primitive, um, for example, say in a nesting scenario like with CNC fabrication? Um, could you ref repeat that question? I, I missed the first part of it. Sure. Uh, is there an easy way to generate serial planes from the primitive? Um, and then the example is nesting, like with a CNC fabrication. Um, so I'm going to stab at this one and, and assume that what they're referring to is when you have a primitive, like, for example, um, we start with something like the square. There's no volume to it in particular. And we want to create that primitive out here in space. I have to turn off my uh, clip cube so that I see my whole object. And as I rotate around that, um, we'll see it's just a flat surface, right? But that is a primitive object. And if we were to take this object and use the extend edge mode, then we have the ability to extend those planes in particular directions. And then we would have the ability to manipulate these planes uh, with the 3D dragger um, and twisting them or, um, or bending them in particular directions. So if I, again, double click so I have access to that um, cage, then I'm going to take my transform mode. And if we click on one particular edge, if I want to transform that edge, then we can twist that plane in particular. So, um, I'm not sure if I'm accurately um, answering that question, but I'm, uh, I'm hoping this is at least getting in the right direction. And if not, I'd, I'd be happy to follow up. Okay. Um, I think that's it for all the questions we have time for. Uh, thank you all who hung out with us and stayed after the time. Um, we have a couple of people asking if they can view the session on the web. Uh, and the answer is yes. We will be sending out a copy of the recording um, very, very shortly. And as always, you can find more on the subdivision tool on our website. Um, feel free to reach out to Jacob directly or to me with any questions. And um, thank you for, thanks for hanging out with us, Jacob. This was awesome. I had a lot of fun with this and I look forward to a follow up um, when 26, or 2017 uh, gets released. Uh, even more subdivision options and I think it's really gonna, it's gonna be an amazing development. So 
look forward to doing it again. Thanks again for everybody that participated today. Thanks, right. Emily. You're very welcome. Take care, everybody. Have a good one.